Dana Matthewson. Thank you so much for coming on to Trips and Global on Wheels to share with us uh, your knowledge regarding fitness and travel and advocacy. So, Thank you. So Dana Matthewson is a Paralympian. She is a she plays wheelchair tennis, and uh, currently she's at the University of College London getting her master's degree in audiology. So when Dana was 10 years old, she contracted a rare neurological disease known as transverse myelitis, which we'll ask her to share more about later on. Uh, it's basically, it affects her spinal cord and causes the immune system to attack a very low region of her back. And uh, she, like I said, is currently living in London and her hobbies include baking, crafting, traveling, and watching Netflix. So with that, let's get started. So as alluded to earlier, Dana, could you please give us more detail of what transverse myelitis is for listeners who don't have much understanding of this? Sure. It's a, it's basically an autoimmune disease. So just in the same way that diabetes is or lupus or anything else like that, um, your immune system attacks itself. And with transverse myelitis, your immune system attacks an area of your spine. And with each person, it's it's variable. So I was quite lucky that mine was around my belly button area or T10. And uh, my injury is incomplete. So when it happened to me, I, um, I was running sprints at soccer practice. And I was a completely, quote unquote, normal child growing up. I didn't have any health concerns or anything. I wasn't sick beforehand. I didn't get hit. Um, at practice or anything to like make my back go into trauma or anything like that so um, I just remember my back starting to hurt really badly it felt like someone was stabbing me it was the worst pain of I can imagine barring maybe what childbirth is like but I haven't had a baby yet so I can't comment on that but um, and it was a horrible pain and then I remember in about 30 minutes maybe less um, I lost all feeling and ability to move my legs, um, and my parents rushed me to the hospital, and luckily they're both doctors, so I didn't have to wait in the ER very long, which I think is critical to the function that I have now, because the faster that you can get steroids in your system to combat the swelling of your spinal cord, which it happens in response to the immune system attacking your spine, um, then you can maybe preserve some of the nerves. Because since you have all of those nerve bundles in your spinal cord, when that gets inflamed, the pain I was feeling was them literally like ripping apart. And so the fact that I could get to the hospital soon enough to preserve some of those nerves is the reason why I can feel my legs now and I can walk a bit. But there is still permanent damage that will never be able to be fixed, obviously. So that's why I use a wheelchair and I play Paralympic sports now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, mm -hmm. So I understand that you're living in London at the moment, getting your master's. I so, am. So how is how is traveling around, wheeling around the city in a in a manual wheelchair? Um, it's definitely not as easy as America. I think that I took living in the states for granted in terms of accessibility. I knew that it wouldn't be the easiest thing moving here just because I'm also in central London, which is the oldest part of the city. So obviously the oldest part means less access because you have the older buildings with less elevators or less ramps. There's always like one little step to get into a shop, things like that. So um, I've encountered a little bit of frustrations in that aspect. I think the most frustrating part to me is that I don't have a car over here because it's, well, A, it's a city, so it'd be impossible to have a car for one because you'd take about 500 hours to get anywhere anyway. But um, the fact that I have to rely on different modes of public transportation is something that I've never had to do in my life. Growing up in California, we don't really have subways or anything like that or even the train. Um, so I never grew up using that. I always just jumped in my car and away I went. So um, here I have to map out, okay, I'll take this tube station to this train and then this train here or this bus here. And if every station was accessible, I think I would have a different outlook. But due to the nature of it being a very old city, only some of the tube or when I say tube, I mean the underground, that's what they call it here. Um, 
is accessible. So I have to map out, okay, I can get here, but then I have to do a really roundabout way to get somewhere else. Or maybe I just have to ditch that entirely and take a taxi. So that part is a bit of a headache. But I have to say that the attitudes towards people with disabilities in England and London as a whole is so much better than in America. Nobody stares at you. People don't think that you're immediately mentally affected because Paralympics are quite well known here. So I would say that the attitudes that people have towards me kind of either balance out the lack of access that they have here. Because in the States, although everything's accessible, nobody is very clued up on Paralympic sports, on people with disabilities, and the treatment that you receive is horrendous, in my opinion. So there's goods and bads about living here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with you when you said it takes 500 hours to get anyway. It certainly feels that way sometimes. Yeah, My like I train at the National Tennis Center sometimes here, which is in um, – it's south of where I live, and I've looked on a map, and it's seven miles away, and it can take up to an hour to get there, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. So for me, I, my campus was near Covent Garden, Holborn area, uh -huh. and sometimes yeah. I would want to go to Shoreditch, and that would uh -huh. take an hour, and that's only two yeah, miles. Yeah, it takes ages. Mm -hmm. It does. So if you could change anything about the physical in infrastructure – of that city, what would it be? Just making all the tube stations accessible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Cause that's... Because that's the fastest way to get anywhere, and then I don't think it would be too much of a hassle then, because I would know that I could get everywhere on my own and, and not having to take a taxi or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So aside from the tube stations being inaccessible, what's been the hardest thing to adjust with your move to London? Um, I, that's a really good question. I think I, I was lucky enough that a lot of my really good friends, um, in life happened to be from tennis and a lot of them just so happened to be English. So moving over here, I never felt lonely in the sense that I didn't have any friends. Um, and I was also lucky enough to make a lot of friends really quickly when I started, um, school over here. So uh, loneliness wasn't an issue. I think actually I did have a lot of trouble adjusting to having snow. As someone from San Diego, I've never had a white Christmas before. So um, when we had a lot of snowfall here, I didn't realize that I wouldn't even be able to push around in it. I thought I could maybe still push to school because that's how I got to school is I do like a 20 minute um, walk or push, whatever you want to call it. And um, I couldn't go anywhere. And then, you know, being inside all the time with no sun, I think I almost got, like, seasonal affective disorder. I was getting, like, stir-crazy and kind of sad, and I didn't know why. And then the sun came back, and then everything was fine again. So I think that was probably the weirdest thing that I had to adjust to. But I've been lucky that I have such a good um, group of people here, and I even have some family that lives over here. So that's been really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember when I was living there, the two hardest things was – the in inaccessible tube stations and the weather being always yeah. gray. Yeah, the weather sucks. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some improvements that can be made so the wheelchair athletes and, um, and uh, able-bodied athletes are treated equally? I remember watching one of your videos and you talking about how there's still a gap there. In, in America or where? Just overall, um, feel free to cover America if, if you feel more comfortable. Um, well, America is really starting at the bottom. I feel like there's just a simple lack of exposure. People don't even know it exists. I think our country's done a really good job of promoting um, you know, organizations such as the Special Olympics, which is great in its own right, but is it could not be further or different from what the Paralympics is. And unfortunately, because everyone knows about the Special Olympics, that's what they think the Paralympics is. And they see anyone in a wheelchair and they assume that that's what anything athletic relates back to. And um, I'm sure I can speak on behalf of many Paralympic athletes in that it is very frustrating to be compared to a Special Olympian because it is so different. Um, 
or even an Olympian, a lot of people say, oh, you've been to the Olympics. And you're like, well, I get what you're saying. But no, I went to the Paralympics. It's different. So I think just a lot of it is just people need to have an education. People need to be exposed to it. I haven't met a single person yet that's watched a bit of wheelchair tennis or wheelchair basketball or any other sport of a high level and not wanted to watch more. So I don't think that there is a lack of interest once people know about it. I think it genuinely is just people don't know it exists. So I'm hoping that um, Paralympic Games like LA 2024 will increase that quite a bit. Um, I even saw an article today on Facebook that said that Paralympic athletes are finally going to be paid the same for um, as the able-bodied Olympians for um, winning medals for the first time ever, and that's a huge step. I think that having a Paralympic Games in your city is what changes a city's opinion on it. I think that's why London, for instance, is so clued up on Paralympics, and everyone here that I see, if I if they see me with my tennis stuff, they're like, oh, are you a... Are you, have you played at Wimbledon? Have you done this? Have you done that? And that would never, ever, ever happen in America. And I think that's just because they were so exposed to it through having a Paralympic Games. So I'm hoping that maybe once America hosts it, then that would be a big game changer. But so far, it really just is at square one of just exposing the, the public to what, what it is that, you know, adaptive athletics, not even just Paralympic sports, but what adaptive athletics is. Mm -hmm. And that was a really good point about Special Olympics and Paralympics. I think many of our listeners um, also probably appreciated your elaboration on that. Yeah, that comparison drives me nuts. (laughs) Like, and I don't want to be rude to anyone that is a Special special Olympian or, or knows someone that is, but it's just so different because one involves a mental disability and one doesn't. So when you do have your full mental faculties, to be compared to someone that doesn't have that is almost insulting. And, um, yeah, I, I really wish that people would understand the difference between those two. Mm-hmm. It's comparing apples to oranges. Yeah, very much so. So can you describe your latest tennis competitions and your hopes for the future in regards to tennis? Um, well, I was most recently at the U.S. Open in New York, which was not a great tournament for me. So I'd, I, w- <laughs> uh, I don't really have a lot to elaborate on that one for that. Um, but, yeah, I've recently been traveling around Europe. We have a circuit that goes all over the world um, and throughout the year the same way that the able-bodied pros do. So um, the European circuit kind of happens over the summertime and then um, and continues until now. Just tomorrow I'll be going to um, the French Riviera for another tournament. And then I'll have a little bit of a training block before there's a, a tournament in Bath in the UK in November. And then to end the year, we have our year-end Masters events, which you have to qualify for. So I've um, applied for doubles Masters, which is in November, and hopefully I get into that. But um, I've been changing a lot of things about my game recently. Um, so I'm kind of like a little baby duckling again, relearning a lot of new things. So for the immediate future, my goals are to just really commit what I've learned in practice to my matches because that's much easier said than done. When you're in high-pressure situations, you kind of revert back to what you know and what you're comfortable with. But the challenge is to go to your new thing even if you're not very good at it yet. So that's kind of my goal for the, for the end of this season. Mm -hmm. that's great well good luck thanks so the the next question kind of relates to a question that I asked previously do you think wheelchair athletes are given the same respect as able-bodied athletes say you know um I don't know I, I I personally am ignorant in this area like whoever the the most the best ten wheelchair tennis player compared to the best able-bodied tennis player. Um, no, they're they're not they're not treated the same at all. And why Definitely do you think not. that is? And um, what improvements can be made so that that gap could be bridged? Well, again, that that just relates to exposure. Um, you see, it it really depends on what country that person is from. Um, you're not that. Some of my best friends now and the people I compete against are from all over the world. So. 
people, I've, I've come to realize that people from Japan very much embrace wheelchair tennis, um, Paralympic sports, but wheelchair tennis especially. So players on our circuit, such as Yui Kaniji and Shingo Kunieda, who are both former world number ones, and they've won Grand Slam titles, they've won Paralympic medals, they are seen in a, in a very, very big way um, in their countries. Uh, British athletes are, they're probably, like, people know their names. They're not super famous to the point where they could go down the street and people would know who they were. But if people saw them at Wimbledon, they would flock to them. Like, I've been at Wimbledon and seen them um, sell out stadiums to watch those matches. Um, France is becoming that way as well. The States, again, is very far behind. That would almost never happen in the States to the point where they don't even know what the sports are. Um, so it really, again, depends on where you're from in terms of the treatment that you get. But I think to me, not to be a broken record, it really all relates back to people knowing that it exists. Once people know it exists, then they'll support it. Then you get agents behind it because they know that they can put money towards you because the public is aware enough of you that they will give you that return. And then you'll sell tickets. That's when... Um, TV things want to cover you because they know that the public wants to watch you. It really is like a big cycle. And, and until we get the public completely aware of the fact that we exist and that we are like high level athletes instead of just, you know, like recreational going out there for fun and more of like a inspirational story. Once until we change that narrative, which is the only narrative in the States, in my opinion, at the moment, everything is about overcoming adversity and all of that, which is great. But we're more than that and I think that's the next step is to getting us treated the same because you don't look at Kobe Bryant or LeBron James or Andy Roddick or people like that and know anything about the background you just know that they're really good players whereas for wheelchair athletes all you know is that like oh wow she's lost a leg or she's done this or she's done that which is a good thing to acknowledge that we have overcome adversity but it doesn't stop there like we actually train the same amount of hours we do the same types of things health-wise, and you still have to commit to training the same way an able-bodied athlete does. And until the public understands that, then things won't change. But it is slowly changing. I've seen it happen in other countries, like I was alluding to earlier. So it, it is possible. It's just different parts of the world need to catch up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the next question relates to um, your major. So you you've decided that you want to become an audiologist. Um, do you have a, mm -hmm. do you, why did you choose that major as opposed to say, um, something sports related? Uh, well, sports has never been my whole life. Uh, I, I grew up in a very, I guess more of a well-rounded household where like academics was really, really strongly emphasized, but then my mom always had us going out of the house and doing this or that. So I was never just focused on one thing. I think I would actually get kind of bored if I just did sports for my whole life. But no, I've always really liked science um, and working with people. Growing up, I thought I wanted to be like a preschool teacher because I loved working with kids. Um, but when I was doing my tour of the University of Arizona, that's where I got my bachelor's degree. Um, my mom was with me and she's a pediatrician and so when I saw the speech and hearing sciences building and I asked her what it was she was able to explain it explain it to me and she told me all about speech pathology and audiology and for a while I actually thought that I would do um, speech pathology and in um, in college you normally have to declare and this isn't just for Arizona this is for um, almost all colleges across the states at least you have to declare like communication disorders or for me it was speech and hearing sciences so you get you have to get a major in both audiology and speech so um that's what I declared my major in I took a lot of speech pathology courses and I liked them but there was just kind of like something missing and then when I took audiology courses I just loved them um it combines the fact that I'm, I'm really nerdy and I like science but then I can also work with people and I'm really into problem solving, so I really like that with audiology. It's really like a big puzzle that, that you put together. So, like, depending on what part of the ear the pathology is in, then there's the type of pathology. Then you do different tests, and that one test leads to another one, or it weeds out a different one. I really like the problem solving aspect of it and the fact that you can help someone 
one immediately. Whereas with speech pathology, it felt to me like it was more of a wait and see thing where you prefer work really hard, but maybe you'll see benefits and maybe you won't. And I didn't like that as much. I like being able to immediately help someone and being able to treat a human sense is pretty amazing. So, um, yeah, that's why I picked audiology. Mm -hmm. So your mom seems to play a big role in, in things, in your hobbies and interests and introductions. It seems I read an article where it said that you shared that your your mother actually introduced you to wheelchair tennis at a camp. So we're transitioning. Yeah, she did. We're transitioning onto disability advocacy here. So it sounds like you've had a lot of positive experiences with family members, friends advocating for you. So what would you change or not change about how others have advocated for you? What methods? or mannerisms did they exhibit that you uh, were uh, are comfortable with or, un- or would change? Um, I don't think that I've experienced too much advocacy being a bad thing. Um, I think you every so often get the teacher that singles you out for maybe needing special help for something when you don't actually need special help for something or um, something like that. But for me, I've never really had an issue with people advocating for me in the wrong way. I think it would be a lack of advocating. Um, so like, for instance, going to a school where nothing's accessible and having to go up the stairs and then no one really understands why that would be annoying or why Dana didn't show up to class today because we had a class completely on the other side of campus that then had three flights of stairs to get to and no one thought to accommodate for that. I, I find more of an issue with that um, as opposed to someone maybe talking down to me and patronizing me and saying like, oh, well, she probably can't do this or can't do that and like meaning to be well-intentioned. I think that rolls off my back a bit more, um, but I don't really tend to have that. I think my family has always been really switched on. The fact that my mom has, um, is a medical professional meant that as soon as I even got home from the hospital, she was like, okay, go set the table. And I was sitting there being like, oh, I was figuring, you know, I'm 10 years old, I'm disabled, now I'm not going to have chores. But my mom made it very clear that my life was not going to be any different. So I never got any special treatment at home or like, you know, patronizing stuff. I didn't get that from my friends. I've never gotten that from my family. So, um, I don't think that I've really had too much of an issue with people trying to help me in the wrong way. Um, Yeah, I think if anything, it would just be people being mindless or asking rude questions or things like that. But that would be more the general public, not anyone that I really know. Mm -hmm. And then what are some effective ways individuals with disabilities like ourselves can advocate for ourselves? Um, So things that you've experienced over the years that work especially well that you can share to others? Um, We just really need to lead by example. I think that people in wheelchairs forget that we are different and people are going to look the same way that if we see something different, we're going to stare at it. Um, When I first got into wheelchair sports, I couldn't stop looking at everyone being like, geez, that disability is weird or this one or that one. And it even continued on to me going into to the Paralympic Village, and this is after me being disabled for more than half my life, and seeing all the different disabilities I saw there, I was almost gawking at them. So people need to remember that that that's just part of human nature to be curious about what you don't understand. But I think that people sometimes take it a bit too far; they stare a bit too much, or they're a bit too rude about things. And it's easy to want to just kind of shut people down and be rude right back to them. But people need to remember that or at least I would urge people to remember that, at least especially in a place like America, for instance, where we're still making a name for ourselves as a, as a group. Um, you need to really lead by example. If people don't understand about your disability or they ask questions about it, talk to them normally. Don't be a brat. Don't be a jerk. Answer their questions. And then they leave that conversation being like, wow, that was a really well-mannered person. That was a really smart individual So if that person went into that conversation thinking that every person in a wheelchair was mentally affected, say, which happens to me quite a bit, if you're eloquent and you answer questions nicely, they'll walk away learning something new that not everybody is like that. 
I think it's just our role to then teach people through example. You don't have to sit down and give them like a huge, you know, lesson on your life and what happened to you. But just show by example. Just be yourself. If people constantly are saying, oh, do you need help? Do you need help? Just like, no, thank you. And then prove to them that you can transfer on your own or you can do something like this on your own. But be gracious and be nice. That's such a big pet peeve of mine. When you see people in chairs that refuse help from anyone because they have something to prove, I think that if you're going to refuse help, do it with a smile or just be gracious and accept the help because that person genuinely is just trying to be nice to you. Just because someone offers to open a door for you, it doesn't mean they feel bad for you. A lot of times it's just manners. So I think it's, to me, we all need to kind of, like I was saying before, lead by example, be a gracious and kind person and then show people what we're like just by living the way that you would want to interact with someone else. If you ask them a question, we need to be kind of the same way, if that that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Definitely. So along the same lines, what were some of your proudest memories of either advocating for yourself or for others? Um, Try to think of a specific time. I think doing things like this, or when I've done interviews and people ask about you know, how things work or, or what have you. Um, any of those moments is a proud moment because, one, it shows that the public is interested, and then the fact that someone wants to hear that from me is still kind of like, wow, really? You want to hear what I think? <laughs> it's still kind of kind of a pinch-me kind of moment. But um, I've been lucky enough to be a tennis instructor at numerous camps, and I think maybe this doesn't fall under the role of advocating, but just teaching different kids how to use wheelchairs, how to push a chair without having the little tippy bars on, how to play a sport, and like seeing them kind of blossom into young adults who were previously confused about wheelchairs and things like that. And I can speak from experience because when I got hurt, I was in that awkward, like, who am I phase? I was only 10. So... um sports was a huge part of like finding my personal identity again and like becoming independent and seeing the world and all that so whenever I'm able to kind of teach by example with young kids or young girls especially um it's it's a really proud and it's a really fulfilling and great moment I wish I could do more of that Mm -hmm. what are some major improvements that need to be made in terms of equality and inclusiveness for people with disabilities, especially wheelchair users? I think a lot of it would be, for places like here, it would be just making access possible because then we're not at the constant mercy of others, like asking for help because then people won't always view us as being helpless in a sense or like less able. Um, So that would be a start. Um, and then again, I think it would just be the education of others so that when people speak to us, they're not speaking in a slower tone of voice or more patronizing and things like that. I think people just need to be exposed, like I was saying before. And, and I think that would lead to equality. Um, if you think about it, like any of the friends that you probably made in your life, they probably weren't exposed to a lot of people in wheelchairs before, but now they treat you the same as they would any other friend. And that's just because you taught them through example and through just exposing them to being around you. And the more and more people we can expose like that, the more people treat us the same as everybody else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're certainly right about that. So are you comfortable with being labeled disabled? Um, If and if not, if what other words would you use to conceptualize our, our group um being called disabled doesn't really bother me. I wouldn't say I enjoy it um I think anytime that you're labeled like that it's a little bit awkward um because someone is automatically calling you something based on your abilities instead of just like oh it's Dana um but in a way it's no different than saying that I'm American or something like that it's putting me into a group and that's fine um disability doesn't really bother me in that sense of the word I hate the word crippled I find that to be awful um people have called me that before and it just really makes you feel really just awful about yourself and like it's really demeaning um but no saying disabled doesn't really bother me when people say you're handicapped that also sounds a bit weird maybe it's because it's so outdated um But no, when people say I'm disabled or I have a disability, I think that bothers me the least of all the words that you could pick. 
and and do you have ideas for us for how to have a more positive um, ring to that word? If you could, uh, if you could choose any word in the universe, what would you what would you choose? How would you conceptualize describe us? Um, God, that's a good question. I've literally never thought about that before. Um. I don't know. To me, it doesn't. I don't really feel like it needs to be changed. And maybe this is something that people might have a lot of issue with. But I find it a little bit annoying when people keep trying to change the terms that that we go by. So, like one time, someone said that I was differently abled, and like, yeah, they're not wrong. But I feel like that almost in itself makes it more of a big deal by having to skirt around with the actual truth. Is the truth is I'm disabled. Big deal. You can say the word and then it's kind of over with instead of having to be like, oh gosh, differently abled. Or it's like how now the new term for things is little people and you can't say midget anymore and you can't say things like that. And I respect that there are terms that people don't like. So maybe that was on par with the word cripple and there does need to be a change. But at the end of the day, I think the less we focus on words and the more we focus on just getting ourselves out into the public and living the same way other people do, then the word won't really become an issue anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't know. The, the labeling of things has never really been a big, a big thing for me because I think I do so much in my life that I, I don't often get labeled as such. So maybe I've been lucky in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I definitely get what you're saying uh, about how not necessarily getting stumbled on the words, but, but, bridging the gap with what resources are offered to able-bodied and making sure that those same resources are also offered to individuals with disabilities and just even evening out the playing field. Yeah, I think so. And then I think it's really important for, for anyone with a disability to realize that they can do more. I think there's so many times that there are people who have a minor setback or a major setback physically and they feel like their life's just over and they can't do anything so then they don't really do much and those are the times that people label us as being so different and so disabled I guess in a sense but the more that you do with it like a lot of the other athletes that I'm friends with like you have to go to the store you just go to the store you don't have to take someone with you you don't have to do this and whatever and I understand that that's not everyone's situation but the more that you just adapt to your situation and take ownership of that, people won't see you differently and they'll just treat you like a person. If you make it such a big spectacle and something to tiptoe around and so worried about, that's when people get worried and like afraid to be around you and all that stuff. And I think that's what I take issue with more than a label. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So s speaking of uh, being active, and lots they saying that there's, there's a lot that we can do. Um, next, we're going to move on to fitness. So why do you okay. think staying fit is especially important for uh, wheelchair users? Uh, it's especially important just because you, you're already leading a sedentary life by nature of sitting down more often. Um, I know that even for myself, I can walk, but living in the city and with limited leg strength, I barely do walk with the exception of being in my own little home, which is emphasis on little. It's a little studio apartment. So I'm not getting a lot of leg exercise. So in that sense, you need to be as active as you can. Otherwise, you're, you know, we burn less calories just because we don't use all of our muscle groups. We don't have as much muscle mass. There's more health complications that come when you're sedentary. Um, just like anyone that's able-bodied, you sit all the time, but you still eat a lot. You're going to get overweight that leads you at risk for cardiovascular problems or diabetes or what have you so um mm -hmm. on the health side that's pretty obvious but I think for me more than anything it's just been about my mental health the more active that I am the happier I am and you can link that back to science and you know, like releasing endorphins and all of that but it just genuinely makes you feel better about yourself you're you're going to be in better shape, which makes you less physically, um, what's the word, self-conscious. Because already being in a chair makes you self-conscious. I don't care who you are. You have to be the most well-adjusted person on the planet to not see your wheelchair at all. I definitely am self-conscious of my chair, um, even though I'm a pretty confident person. So if I can be happy with how my body looks, 
um, then that makes you already a more confident person and makes you want to go out and get into the world more than you do if you're really not happy with how you're feeling as a, as you know, in terms of your own self image. So I think it's important for a lot of things, not just your own internal health, but also your mental health and, and your outlook on life. Mm -hmm. It all kind of goes together. Yes, definitely. So how can wheelchair users stay fit? Like what kind of exercises or recreational activities can they get involved in? So think of the general wheelchair user audience. I know you and your friend group are probably very active. Um, <laughs> um, I think, you know, for the average person, and this is like, for instance, last week, my mom was visiting me and we went, um, we just did a lot of walking around town. So pushing for me, walking for her. But we were just walking around everywhere. And by the end of the day, she was like, she tracked how many steps that she had done. And it said that we had gone eight miles that day. And that was just going to stores, going here, going there. And that's not even trying to work out. That's just walking. Um, and that even that, you know, keeps you fit. It gets you outside. Um, for wheelchair users, when you're pushing around, you're not only pulling your own weight, but you're pulling the weight of the chair. So that's almost weight training in and of itself a little bit. Um, getting fresh air, doing all of that, I would say that's something that, that anyone can do, barring um, certain physical disabilities, is just going, go out and go for, a, go for a push, go for a walk with someone. Um, that was, that's just kind of my advice for the general public, but for people that are a bit more keen, there's always things that you can do in a gym. You can use free weights, you can use those hand bicycles, a lot of gyms now have those to work out your upper body, which is great cardio. Mm -hmm. Um, I've gotten, I've nearly died on those, not literally, but <laughs> I'm like so out of breath on those because they're such a good workout. Um, but yeah, you can, you can do all sorts of things. You can buy resistance bands like those TheraBands, um, and just do stretching and like resistance type things at home. There's tons of stuff that someone can do to stay in shape. But I think my favorite thing would, would be not the gym. I hate the gym. Um, I'm like the one professional athlete that avoids the gym at all costs which is probably not great and I need to change that but um yeah just get out and see your city go push around with a friend go push around a mall even and that burns calories without even thinking about it mm -hmm. yeah I agree with you I avoid the gym as well because I don't it's know no worst. matter <laughs> no matter how many commercials they that how beautiful they make it look in the commercials. I just don't know how sweating inside a confined space could be enjoyable. No, gyms, gyms just aren't fun. And then, like, if you're on a machine, someone's waiting for it and they're watching you. And then, yeah, I, just, I don't like gyms. So it's said that the majority of wheelchair users will experience shoulder problems at some point in their life. And some of the other common issues with wheelchair users especially are elbow tendonitis and carpal tunnel. Have mm -hmm. you experienced with any of these issues? And if you have, how have you dealt with them? Um, knock on wood, no, I haven't. Um, with tennis, though, things like tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, um, shoulder problems, all of that is a very, very big risk, I guess, or like a common problem that um, wheelchair tennis or especially any person in a wheelchair will come into you. But the way that um, myself and other athletes that I know avoid it is just by a lot of stretching, by doing um, stretches with those resistance bands that I mentioned a little while ago, um, and then just staying active to keep those muscles strong. That's kind of the best way to ward those off. But yeah, a lot of people will then, and I, this is another thing I need to get better at, going to see the physios, um, people don't realize that you can go and get sports massages or, or massages anywhere in the world. Like they have busy videos all around, probably in your own hometown, just call up someone and go and get a massage on your arm to help release those muscles and keep everything happy. Um, a lot of maintenance is just really important. Take a hot bath, do your stretches in the morning and at night, because at the end of the day, like for people in wheelchairs, your upper body is crucial for your whole life really so um the same way that an able-bodied person might get up and stretch their legs out do it with your arms um it, and it takes hardly any time at all and you'll be a lot happier <laughs> mm -hmm. that's right so next we're going to move on to travel so you've okay. done a lot of traveling in the last couple years yeah i live out of a suitcase mm -hmm. so what are <laughs> 
where all have you traveled to? And、uh, what, yeah, what countries, continents? Feel free to、um, share with us some highlights. Let's see. I've been to. I think I've been to almost every continent now. Um, the usual places that I end up going, because at the at the end of the year. Or sorry, at the end of the day, you pretty much go to the same tournaments every single year. So you go to the same countries every year. Not to downplay it, it's very exciting. But like after you've kind of been two or three years, it, the excitement wears off. But、um, during the year, I get to go to. Let's see. Well, I went to Rio for the Paralympic Games. That was exciting.、Um, I've gotten to go to South Korea for some tournaments. Japan,、uh, Turkey. South Africa, the Netherlands, England, obviously,、um, America, obviously,、um, Australia.、Uh, let's see what else. Canada. I've not been to China yet, and I'd like to go because I'm half Chinese, so that would be pretty cool. I've been to an airport, but that doesn't count.、Um, never been to Russia. That would be cool to go there.、Um, let's see what else. I've been Belgium, France. All over, really.、Um, yeah, I've gotten to see. It feels like a big chunk of the world, but then you go and look at a world map, and you're like, "Well, I haven't really been everywhere." So there's still a lot of traveling that I'd like to do yet. But no, ten. That's my favorite thing about tennis, aside from the amazing friendships and relationships that I built on the tennis tour, is the fact that I've been able to see the world while doing a job that I love.、Um, I feel so lucky that I've had that experience. Mm、hmm. So yeah, you have done a lot of traveling. So for for wheelchair users, what are some more wheelchair friendly cities, countries that you've traveled to, and and what were their um uh physical what was the physical infrastructure like there? Um. Well, unfortunately, with tennis tournaments, it's like a business trip where I don't often see a whole lot of the city unless I. It's kind of a catch twenty two. If you lose early, then you have a lot of free days in the tournament to go explore. But you obviously don't want to lose early. You want to be in the tournament as long as possible. But then, if you're in the tournament as long as possible, all you're seeing are the tennis courts in your hotel. So、um, I can't say that I have a super well rounded view of every place that I've been.、Um, but I would say that Japan was very very good for wheelchairs. They're so innovative there.、Um, And what city were have- you in in Japan? I've been to Fukuoka and I've been to Tokyo.、Mm-hmm. Um, Fukuoka is a smaller town, obviously, but even then they had, you know, every everything for a disabled person that you would want, which is pretty simple. You just want elevators and you want ramps at the end of the day. <laughs> at least for someone with my disability, someone with a higher disability might look out for more things, but I'm unaware of what those would be.、Um, But yeah, in terms of public transport, I could get on all the trains if I wanted.、Um, everyone there was really, really nice and really, really accommodating. The Japanese culture is just—they really want you to come to Japan and like love it. And you could tell they were just so nice. Korea was really good as well.、Um, they're not as welcoming, I found, but in terms of like providing what you would need, they were great.、Um, I haven't really run into a place that was just horrible. Except for,、um, well, I just recently went to Belgium, and that was really difficult. But that's because、um, we were in Brussels, and Brussels is—it was kind of like I was saying with London. It's just an older city, so you can't really expect an older city to really be made for you.、Um, every other place I've been in Belgium has been amazing, so I don't want to say that Belgium is horrible because they're not by any means. But、um, no, I haven't really been anywhere that's just been, you know, downright awful. But again, that's because a lot of the places that I've been to have just been tennis courts and then hotels. And then I think I'm lucky enough that because I can stand and walk and go up some stairs or transfer in and out of cabs quite easily, maybe I don't notice the same things that someone else might in the same cities. Mm-hmm. So for、But、you, by far, like America is the easiest place to get around because we have that ADA、um, law where everything has to be accessible, barring like the oldest buildings ever. 
um, or even Australia was really good. The, the newer the place that you go to, the easiest it's going to be. I think that's the that's the thing that people need to remember. Even in Lon- even in England, say, or even London, if you go to an old part of London, like say the Tower of England, you're going to have a hard time. But if you go to a newer newer part, like a new development, it's going to be all accessible and it's going to be great. So I think it's just having to not expect everything to be accessible and kind of adapt yourself to where you're going and kind of have reasonable expectations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What were some of your biggest challenges traveling as a wheelchair user, um, either personally or that you imagine as a whole that wheelchair users would, would find challenging while traveling? Um, well, I think for me, as a as a wheelchair tennis player, we travel with a lot of stuff. Um, even able-bodied tennis players, I've seen pictures of them at the airport, and they have loads. So, um, like, for instance, I'm going to the airport tomorrow for a tournament, and I will have my tennis chair frame, um, a special bag for the wheels to protect them, because airplanes are horrible with chair and all that stuff, because they break them and what have you. So... Um, I'll have that's two items already. Then I'll have my racket bag and then I'll also have my luggage bag and then I'm also in my day chair. So everywhere I go, I travel with at least four pieces of luggage, which are already quite big. Um, cause sometimes you do stints on the road that are five to six weeks long. So your luggage bag is really big and really heavy. So that means that when I'm at the airport, I need to then find a trolley to put all of my luggage on. Sometimes you can't find the trolley. Sometimes they're really difficult to push. Um, And then you have to ask for help. And I don't really have an issue with asking people to help me. Just kind of put on the the little smile and be like, excuse me, would you mind helping me get here or there? And I've never met a single person that says no to that. Most, Most of the time, everyone's really, really nice and more than willing to help you for two minutes of their day. Um... But I I think that for me, again, because I have almost all of my upper body um, and and my core to help me push a trolley like that, it's still difficult, but I can do it. Whereas someone who's maybe a quad would have a lot of trouble. I don't know how the quad tennis players do it. I'm sure they do it the same way as me. But again, it's more difficult. Even lifting huge bags on and off the trolley, I have to ask for help. So um, those are some difficulties. I think other difficulties that that I've experienced on tour, um, would be someone not having an accessible room if they need it. Again, that's something I'm lucky enough that I don't need to have because I can, um, get in and out of showers and bathtubs and what have you with, with relative ease. But if someone can't and they need to have a tub say, and that doesn't happen, or you can't get your chair in and out of the bathroom or, or things like that, I think those are big things. So always call ahead and make sure that the that the hotel is going to be equipped for you or even has those things. I think a lot of people assume that all hotels will be accessible to some degree or that all hotels will be huge like they are in America and have like two double beds in them and such. But the rest of the world is not like that. Everything else is very small. So it's really good to plan ahead if you need that extra help. Mm -hmm, Definitely. What are some common wheelchair malfunctions you've had while traveling and how have you dealt with them? Oh, God, I really hope you're not jinxing me for tomorrow. Um, I've not had a lot of malfunctions, knock on wood again. Um, I mean, I don't think it's really common to have a lot of wheelchair malfunctions, to be honest. I think maybe sometimes, like, your side guard might get lost. or something. That's never happened to me because everything's bolted down on my chair. Um you know, every once in a while, they won't bring your chair up to the gate at the at the airport, and you'll have to, like, go in one of those horrible airport chairs down to baggage claim or things like that. But I haven't really had any any real issues, knock on wood. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's good. So what are some solution pan- plans you have in mind to make traveling more accessible to individuals with disabilities? I think, again, like I was saying with the hotels, making sure that someone calls ahead and, and the room is something that they can that they can use, even a taxi, getting to and from, at more adaptive taxis. London is a great city in that every single taxi here is accessible if you need that. So I think if more cities did something like that, that might be great for a, a person in a wheelchair that can't maybe transfer in and out as 
as quickly as someone else might. Um, airlines are pretty good, I think, in terms of the aisle chairs and stuff like that. But, yeah, I mean, I've even seen things with suitcases where you have a massive carabiner that can, like, attach to the back of your chair so you can pull it along instead of having to awkwardly push it. Little innovations like that are great. Um, but, yeah, I think... I think I'm just so used to my little mode of transportation that I, I've selfishly not really thought outside of that because I've gotten so used to my little pattern of like, okay, I do this now and I do this, 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 and then I get on the plane and then that's that. I have my own little routine, but that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's all kind of, that's a really subjective question as well because each person will want to do things a bit differently. So I think, unfortunately, that will come with just someone taking a trip and realizing what matters most for them and what could help them in that situation. But a lot of times the main thing is don't be afraid to ask for help. People are everywhere and they will definitely help you. I've had to ask for help numerous times and I, I know I'll have to ask help for help numerous times tomorrow even and people are going to help you and then it makes your day way easier. Don't be stubborn and like not ask just because you don't want to be that helpless person. It's not worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. So we've come to our last question. What are some perks of traveling in a wheelchair? Oh, there's loads. You never have to wait in lines. Um, you don't have to wait in like that large customs line when you go somewhere, which is great. And I've always found that hilarious because if anyone is equipped to wait in a line, it's us because we're sitting down. But they always think like, oh my God, she's in a wheelchair. Get her out of this line. She can't handle it. So... I don't argue with that ever. That's always great. Um, I think that's the biggest one in terms of travel is just that you get to beat any of the any of the cues. It definitely doesn't help you in terms of security because it takes longer. You have to get padded down and all of that, so it's not a perk there. Um, you don't have to take your shoes off, though, and that's sometimes nice depending on what shoes you're wearing. But... Yeah, I would say that's kind of the main thing, really. Um, well, um, that's a wrap, Dana. Thank you so much for spending this hour with us and being so oh, thank candid. Thank you for having me. Yeah, being so candid and so genuine and trying your best to answer our questions very thoroughly. So we really appreciate your time. Um, thank you. Yeah, of course.